Oh man, that song is a classic 1960s song about the great spiritual question. Who are we? Who is God? And how would you even know? For many of us listening to that song, you remember your first Who concert. For others of us a little bit younger, you remember your first CSI episode, right? (laughs) And on our Magical Mystery Tour, we want to try and answer that question. And we've been looking at how different religions claim different holy books that really have very different answers to the question of who is God and who are we. One example of probably the most well-known holy book in our culture today would probably be Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. So we're going to begin today in England. Because Charles Darwin, you may not realize, was actually an ordained pastor. He went to seminary. That was his only education. And he was a strong follower of Jesus. He and his wife had a devout faith in God, and they had somewhere between eight to ten children. In their letters, which we have records of, we see them talking about their faith in Jesus, their faith in God, and their wife Anna got sick. And they were believing, they were trusting that God would rescue, save, heal their daughter. Unfortunately, Anna died. And with that, Charles Darwin refused to even go to her funeral. And this set him on a a journey to explore scientific discoveries, but also to prove that there not only was not a God, but there certainly was not a God that you could trust. So his book, Origin of the Species, otherwise known as the Preservation of Favored Races, uh, if you know the full title. It's an interesting book because it's referenced in our culture to tell us who we are. You and I are highly evolved animals. Who is God? Unnecessary. And yet it's a book that hardly anyone has read. My friend Bill Heckel is a biologist who attends here. On his spiritual journey, he said, you know, this is the, the Bible of our culture, and I don't know anyone who's read it. I said, well, I've read half of it. He said, I don't know anyone who's even read that half. But in that holy book... It claims that God doesn't exist, that we are highly evolved animals, and that how we find truth is through the scientific method. Now, contrast that with America, another holy book. This might be the Book of Mormon, for example. The Book of Mormon indicates that uh, Jesus came to America uh, post what happened in the Old and New Testament. And when he came there, the claim is that Jesus is not spirit, like the Bible says, that God was actually uh, has a physical body. And that you can be a child of God, a son of God, just as Jesus was. So Jesus was a son of God, and you can be a son of God. And so that's unique because where Charles Darwin said we were highly highly evolved animals, now we have Joseph Smith saying that you can be a son of God like Jesus was a son of God. Very unique. Here we said God doesn't exist. Here we say God has a body. Now contrast that with another claim from the Quran. So the Quran... If you've read that, I have a friend who's a Muslim scholar who we've had here several times. He gave me a copy of the Quran. I've had an opportunity to read about three-fourths of it. The Quran is unique because it says that God does not have a body. God does not have children. So God definitely didn't have a son of God, and you and I cannot be his children because that is actually blasphemous to think that the Almighty God could have children. Now here you see these very unique differences already. Who are you? You can be someone created by God who obeys Allah. You can be a highly evolved, you are a highly evolved animal. And here you can be an actual God like Jesus was God. Still think all religions are the same? Here, God is so transcendent he doesn't have children. Here, God doesn't exist. And here, God allows you to be a God like he is as you develop through that process. Now, what's interesting is whether it's the Book of Mormon, which few have read, the Quran, which few have read, or the origin of species, which few have read. Then we get to the Bible, which few have read. (laughs) So it's interesting that all of these holy books that make claims about life, about truth, about us, about God, are relatively unread. Yet the 1960s was a time that the Bible and its claims that you were created by God, that you could be adopted into his family, that you can be a loved child, you won't be God like Jesus was God, but you can actually know your creator in a very intimate, personal way. The words of this book were put into music in the 1960s. In fact, one of the classic ones was a song that actually takes a letter written or a writing written by Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says, in a world with so many truth claims about life, with so much uncertainty, where there's times things are going well and, then, and times things are going to go poorly and there's times that things need to start and things need to stop, This song, which comes directly out of the Bible, says, 
we need a source of truth to turn to. We need a source of knowledge we can turn to during turbulent times. See if you recognize these words of this song from the 1960s that come directly out of the Bible. So, in case you wonder, you don't know anything about the Bible, and you I know that song. You know something about the Bible. That's in the book of Ecclesiastes. That comes directly out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And what's interesting is those words are saying that in a world where there's war and there's hate and there's ups and there's downs, we're longing for a purpose under heaven. We're longing for answers. We, we want some place to find answers to why we're here and who we are and who God is. So the question is, is the Bible, is the Bible a place that we can actually find uh, a source of truth? Is the Bible a place and is it a reliable source that we can use for our process of finding who God is and who the truth is in that process? That's the question we want to ask ourselves this morning. To do that, I want to tell you a story. And a story uh, occurred when I lived in Atlanta. We had several people in Atlanta who were faculty members at Emory University. And so they asked me to come to a gathering of about 50 to 100 students, and two-thirds of which were hostile, curious, or at least skeptical toward Jesus, God, and the Bible. So I came in. You could read the body language that day. You could tell the folks who were just ready to pounce on me because I was going to describe why I thought the Bible was the most historically accurate document. Pretty bold claim. So I walked in the room. You could see some had some general questions. Some were ready to pounce on me. And so we began that day, and I said, what are some of the reasons we can't trust the Bible? And we began to list them on the dry erase board. Some of the classics, it makes supernatural claims. We've got talking snakes for crying out loud. We've got talking donkeys. We've got people walking on water. Books that make supernatural claims are not believable, we wrote down. Two, the time between when the events occurred, Jesus, Noah, whoever, and the time we have the manuscripts written. There's just hundreds, thousands of years between the time it occurred and the time the Bible was written. Who knows what kind of legends, who knows what kind of lies, fabrications, the telephone game was put in there. We wrote that on the board. Then we talked about the copying process. And even if it was written accurately to begin with, by the time we got our English version, who knows what the truth is? I'm sure there were people who changed stuff or added things or took stuff away. Therefore, the copying process is the reason we can't believe it. So we had a very spirited uh, conversation, about 15 minutes, where we listed all the different reasons why people had heard they couldn't trust the Bible. I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, we've had a good time uh, bringing all of our questions and accusations out. What kind of a test do you need to prove that any historic document is true? And all of a sudden, this very lively group who had lots and lots of ideas on why you couldn't trust the Bible, when I asked for criteria for how do we know that Caesar wrote Gaelic Wars, how do we know that Homer wrote the Iliad, what series of tests could we put upon any document to know if it was true? And the room got real quiet. I said, well, then could we at least bring some humility to the table? It's hard to pass a test until you have a test, right? So it's hard to know if the Bible's reliable, if it can pass the test of credibility, if you don't actually have any test to pass. And it went from a, a very potentially hostile conversation to a very productive one. Because we all brought a little bit of humility to the table to say, hey, I've heard some things, uh, I've investigated a little but not a lot, but I don't really know what the tests are that any historic document might have to know if the Bible even passes it. Because it's hard to pass a test until you have a test. So I want to give you a series of tests, three tests in particular, that not only we can apply to the Bible, these are tests that can be used for any historic document to find out if it's actually reliable. If it's a place you should go to for your source of truth regarding who you are, who God is, or whether or not it really is true. And here's my hope. I hope today that if you're not sure about the Bible, either really not sure, hostile toward it, or curious, if you consider yourself a thinker, I hope today I will help thinkers believe. And if you're a believer, I hope you'll think. If this could be a place where thinkers believe and believers think, because many of you have asked good questions about the Bible to your religious friends, 
how do you know the Bible's true? And they've said, well, I just believe it. And you're like, that's an answer? Oh, you don't need evidence. The, that's the opposite of faith. Well, I want to tell you that's not true. Faith without evidence is called ignorance. And so as believers, we need to be able to give an articulate explanation for why we've come to our conclusions. And if you're a thinker, you're very right to think that many of the answers you've heard from religious people are pretty lame and pretty ignorant. And I want to give you some tests that I think would be helpful for you to begin to explore any ancient document and see whether or not the Bible can meet the test. So the first one that that folks use is called the manuscript test. So what we want to do is we want to look at a big pile of manuscripts and say, how many copies do we have of the manuscripts? And number two, what is the distance between the time Homer lived and wrote the Iliad, the time Caesar wrote, for example, the time Aristotle wrote? What is the distance in time between when they did what was claimed and when our earliest manuscript occurs? It's called the manuscript test. So, based on what you've heard, or based on what you've uh, heard on television, or maybe from a college class, you've heard that the Bible is, is not doing well in this area. But let's apply the test to a few other pieces of, of literature. Homer was writing in 900 B.C., writing the Iliad and a few others. So, that's the time at which he wrote the Iliad. Did you know the earliest manuscript we have is 400 B.C., 500 years after the event? And this is considered, maybe not a gold standard, but a silver standard. We feel like this is really strong documentation that we could get within 500 years that the manuscripts would be that close to when it was written. That's 500 years. Let's take uh, Aristotle. We've all heard Aristotle reference in college classes, and, and somebody talked about Plato or Aristotle. Did you know he was writing in 330 B.C., but the earliest manuscript we have of his writings is 1100 A.D.? Yet, have you ever heard a teacher say, we're not really sure if Aristotle wrote this? Look at how many years there are in there that who knows who could have changed the words of Aristotle. And yet, this time span, when applied to Aristotle or or even to Socrates and others, no one questions it. Even though there's a huge gap of hundreds and hundreds of years in Aristotle's writing to our manuscript. Take Julius Caesar. He's writing in 50 B.C., dies about 6, 10 um, B.C., and his earliest manuscript is 1,000 A.D., so a 1,000 years between the two. But these are considered extremely reliable documents in every circle. No one questions whether Julius Caesar wrote uh, the Gaelic Wars, whether or not Homer wrote the Iliad. So based on your preconceived thoughts or what you've heard before, wouldn't you guess that the Bible is far worse than this? Wouldn't you guess that, well, if a thousand years is good, the Bible must be like, you know, two thousand years? Well, let me show you the documents on it. The New Testament occurred in about 50 to 100 A.D., over the time period of Jesus and the disciples, writing and teaching. In our earliest manuscripts, we actually have a copy that dates to 150 A.D. Within 50 to 100 years, and more than that, because of some of the creeds that are referenced in there, some of the songs that are being sung, some of the doctrines that are cited in the books, we can actually get the dating to within three years. If you haven't read it before, Lee Strobel was a uh, writer for the Chicago Sun-Times, an agnostic. He went to prove the Bible wasn't true, and in his journey he began to find the evidence from the manuscripts were so strong, the Bible is not only passing the test, it passed the test far beyond any other ancient document in the time period between when it was written and when the manuscripts occur. He goes into detail to show you can get it within three years in his book, The Case for Christ. Another guy who is an agnostic and atheist, his name was Josh McDowell. He's come and spoke at our church a couple times. He unrolled one of those scrolls. He owns one of the ancient scrolls that jumps back 900 years. He unrolled it right here in our church service twice in the last year and a half. And he said, looking at the manuscripts is what's convinced him this is reliable. And he talked about the the process the scribes went through to copy it. Rather than we sort of slop something together and, you know, who knows what's going to go on. People were trained for generations to copy letter by letter with three people watching over. And after every letter was copied from one scroll to another, jumping 900 years almost every time you did a new scroll, It wasn't considered reliable until a counter came and counted every single letter. They knew the middle letter in the first five books of the Bible. So 
So counters start at both sides, and if they didn't get to the same middle letter, it wasn't um, certified, and they had to go back and find any mistakes. Then another group of counters came in and counted the middle word. And if it didn't come from start to middle, from end to middle, to that word, they had to restart again. So it's an incredible, no one had a copying process like the ancient Jews did because of the sacredness they found in making sure there weren't mistakes getting into the scriptures. So he has a book called Evidence of the Man's Verdict. You've got, to pretty, you've got to really be committed to getting the evidence if you're going to read this. It's like an encyclopedia of information on whether or not the Bible's true. But the manuscript test is one that the Bible is incredibly strong in getting down to within 10 years, within 3 years, if you look at Lee Strobel's evidence. The second part of the manuscript test is, well, how many do we have, though? Like, do we have one copy of it that's within that? Do we have two copies? If you can get the number of manuscripts gives a sense of, let's see if mistakes crept in. We can compare five pieces and say, this one had an extra sentence here, these four didn't, this one probably was added, this one probably wasn't. So, let's look again at our test. How do ancient pieces of literature line up to these tests? Well, here again is Homer. 900 B.C. to 400, and we have 643 copies that we can compare any changes in. Gold standard. Six, that's why we're so confident, despite the years that occurred, that we can know for sure that what we're reading is true. We have 643 copies in different parts of the country that we can compare and see if any changes occurred. Let's take uh, Aristotle, 49 copies to compare. That's why we're so confident. Julius Caesar only has 10 copies, but still, for an ancient piece of literature, that's considered incredibly reliable. So now let's move to the New Testament, the accounts of Jesus in the early church. What would your guess be that the number would be? What number would it need to be for you to have some degree of confidence that this book might be historically accurate? So put that in your head. Yeah, if I could hit 10, maybe. If I could hit between 49 and 643, I'd consider it. Have that number in your head. We actually have, of the New Testament, 24,000 copies of manuscripts. So you can know exactly if any changes occurred because you have so many pieces to evaluate it on. Which is why the Bible is not just the gold standard, it's the platinum standard. It's in a category all its own, Old Testament as well, and be able to know exactly if a change occurred or didn't. And as they've compared this to a, a science called textual criticism, they found that 99.9% .9 of the manuscripts are accurate and that 0.1% doesn't affect any major doctrine. It's the difference between maybe how the British say photo with a F-O-T-O and how the Americans might say photo with P-H. It's very minor details that are very distinguishable based on the amount of manuscripts we have. So that's the manuscript test. And I'm telling you, the Bible is so supreme here that if you say, well, I don't believe the Bible's true, that's fine. But just know if the Bible's not historically accurate, no other ancient document is accurate. Because it passes the test in a way that no other document does. Maybe you're familiar with the, uh, the movie. I, I, it was a book before it was a movie um, with... Uh, uh, Tom Cruise, that he played in Interview of the Vampire, a terrible movie series. Um, but the book did really well. It was written by a woman named Anne Rice. Now, Anne Rice wrote these vampire chronicles and erotica thrillers, and she was also, prior to that fame, an investigative reporter. She decided to go on a journey to see if the Bible was true. And as an investigative reporter, more of those skills than the vampire erotica skills, she began to look at the claims that she had heard by her friends for years about whether or not you could trust the Bible. And here's what she said as she investigated the Bible and eventually became a follower of Jesus and a follower that this book was a source for truth about God. She said, what gradually came clear to me was that many of the skeptical arguments, arguments that insisted most of the Gospels were suspect, for instance, were written too late to be eyewitness accounts, they just lacked coherence, those arguments. They were not elegant. Arguments about Jesus himself were full of conjecture. Some books were no more than assumptions piled upon assumptions. Absurd conclusions were reading on the basis of little or no data at all. I saw almost no skeptical scholarship that was convincing. And the Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, shredded by critics, lost all intensity when reconstructed by various theorists. In sum, the whole case of the non-divine Jesus, 
who stumbled into Jerusalem, somehow got crucified by nobody and had nothing to do with the founding of Christianity and would be horrified by what it, if he knew about it today. That whole picture, which was floated in the liberal circles I frequented as an atheist for 30 years, that case was not made. Not only was it not made, I discovered in this field some of the worst and most biased scholarship I'd ever read. Now, that's not some Christian speaking. That's a skeptic who went through a journey of looking at the evidence. And one of those pieces she looked at was the manuscript test. The second piece is a test I want to give you is the eyewitness test. And she references this here with the idea of eyewitnesses. Now, what is an eyewitness test? We had a friend of mine used to attend here. And he was a CSI investigator uh, here in Cincinnati. I said, now, how would you know, like a, unlike a scientific test, how would you, what kind of test would you use to recount a historic event? Like, how do you know what happened in the crime when you investigate? He said, oh, there's a, several tests we use that are different from scientific tests to recount what happened in a crime. The first thing is you want to get as many eyewitness accounts as possible. Because the more you have, the more you can compare the consistencies or inconsistencies, eyewitness accounts. Two, he said, as you're listening to the different folks, you want to have a general agreement on the storyline, which makes sense. Three, you want to hear apparent contradictions. Now, that's weird. You want to hear apparent contradictions? Why would you want, as a police officer, to hear apparent contradictions? He said, well, for two reasons. Number one, if all three of your eyewitnesses say the exact same thing word for word, I went down the road and I noticed that the sun was about a third of the way up when the man walked out of the bank. Next person. I remember when I came to the scene, the sun was about a third of the way up. That's a strange phrase for three people to repeat word for word. You'll know that they're lying. They've concocted the story. There should be apparent contradictions where one person mentions two cars because of their vantage point. Somebody else only mentions one car because of their vantage point. And as you put the evidence together, the apparent contradictions come together when you see the different vantage points. Now, that's fascinating. He said, I said, well, as you've looked at the Bible, do you see that? He said, without a doubt. You have a general agreement from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, and James. Incredible amount of eyewitness account. And Luke, who is a historian, is actually quoting hundreds or thousands of eyewitness testimony in his account in both Luke and Matthew. That's what Luke and Acts. He says, so you have thousands of eyewitness accounts who generally agree in the storyline. And when you see apparent contradictions, they're easily reconcilable on the difference between somebody emphasizing angels because he's writing to this audience, somebody else who's downplaying that because of this audience. I said, so you would say as an, a CSI investigator, when you look at the Bible, that it passes the eyewitness test, he goes, without a doubt. Now, many people, when you think of the Bible, they think of the Bible as fantasy, as myth, not as history. But the Bible doesn't claim to be an allegory. It doesn't claim to be... A myth. It doesn't claim to be an Aesop's fables. It claims to be historic eyewitness accounts. I'll give you two versions of this. Here's two eyewitness accounts from Luke, and which I'll mention uh, his authorship later, as well as John. Inasmuch as many have taken to set an order to the narrative of those things which have happened, you see, many people have tried to write down what Jesus did, which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers to the word delivered them. He goes, I went to interview the eyewitnesses. I went and got notes from the shepherds who say they saw him. I went and interviewed Mary. What was it like when, when, when the angel of Gabriel appeared to you? I went and talked to the Romans. I went and talked to the, the guards. I went and got eyewitness account, and I put it all here in this book for you to read, my skeptical friend Theophilus. It seemed good to me, having had perfect understanding of all things, meaning I was there, I, I witnessed much of this myself, I was there from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. This is an account orderly of what happened, how it happened, where it happened, so that what? So you, Theophilus, could know the certainty, not believe it, not apply it, not wish it, that you could know this really happened and it's really true. That's his claim. Now, you don't have to believe it, but let the Bible make its case. It's saying this is eyewitness evidence of a factual event that occurred. John will show up years later and write, 
a separate account that agrees in general scope and on the main points as well. Here's what John says. Different eyewitness. That which we, from the beginning, we have heard this. Not we believe this. Not we, 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 this is not dogma. This is not belief. This is not religion. These are things we were eyewitnesses to. We heard them. We saw them with our eyes. We touched it. We looked upon this. We have seen. We bear witness to these as facts. We have seen and heard about this account of Jesus and what he did with the Father. So these are claiming to be eyewitness accounts. Now, immediately that brings up an objection. What's the objection? Chad, you can't use the Bible to support the Bible. That is classic circular reasoning. Look, the Bible is definitely God because he says that he says that it's the Bible. Therefore, it's the Bible. That doesn't make any sense. That's circular reasoning. You hear that a lot. And I want to try and show you that's actually not reasonable when you understand what the Bible is. A misunderstanding about the Bible makes people think that quoting the Bible to quote the Bible is circular reasoning. So in order to do that, I want to show you a quick video to understand what the Bible is, and then I'll show you why quoting the Bible to quote the Bible isn't circular reasoning. It's just very, very convenient. Let's watch. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things and confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling. And they leveraged all this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So, there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians, who took them away into exile. Then, at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. So the Bible is a collection of dozens of historic documents and scrolls put together in one place. Here's an example. When I was in high school, we had a student doing their student teaching in my history class. And the assignment was given to all 30 of us to do an oral presentation on Abraham Lincoln. All 30 of us giving the same speech on Abraham Lincoln. I was 20th in line. I was the 20th person to get up in front of our class and say, I'm about to speak to you about Abraham Lincoln. You look at all your classmates. So I walk up, and after having heard 20 speeches on Abraham Lincoln, I said, but mine... Well, i got to tell you something first. When I was 16, I, I thought I could rap. And I wrote a lot of original raps. And sadly, most of them are go- – actually, maybe uh, gladly, most of them are gone. But this one, for whatever reason, at age 16, is still stuck in my head that I wrote for this class. I walked up that day. Today I'd like to talk about Abraham Lincoln. Oh, And I've done it in a rap. He was president, lawyer, and Republican, Douglas Gettysburg, and uglier than sin. He was born in Kentucky and called Honest Abe, but his wife Mary Todd wasn't much of a babe. And I went on. That's all I remember. Oh, Abraham Lincoln. (laughs) Suddenly it was interesting. Now, when I wrote that, all those facts came from documents. For example, I had an Encyclopedia Britannica. I got some of that information out of. All right? And and, uh, I got some of the information from a a biography on Abraham Lincoln. All right? So different sources. Then I also got some notes from conversations and, and historic letters we have from the Douglas Lincoln debates. So this was my reference list. 
Now, these are three separate documents that we are showing a common story between them. Now, what if I had taken my three documents and duct taped them together? Now, if I quote from the autobiography to reference his letters in the debate, to reference his autobiography, does that make it circular reasoning? Or does it just make it convenient? See, the Bible, these are separate historic documents duct taped together for you. It's not circular reasoning. It's just convenience. You have to run over here to find that scroll and run over there to find that scroll. So these are multiple eyewitness accounts written over thousands of years. It's like an ancient reference form, only put in a very convenient guide. And here, over thousands of years, different cultures, different languages, you have people telling the same storyline of what God is trying to do to rescue, to love, to embrace, to chase after wayward people. And a way he's going to do it is to die on their behalf. He predicts it, and then he fulfills it through that process. So, the eyewitness account. And that's why the Bible is trying to answer that question. What does it look like to have eyewitness testimony? Okay, third... The third test we want to apply to any a document, and that includes Lewis and Clark, right? Where they make the, the Adventures of Lewis and Clark or Marco Polo. That includes the Book of Mormon. That includes the Quran or the Bible. The Bible and these holy books make claims. So and so went over the river, and there was a city there. We should be able to go over a river. Lewis and Clark have incredible drawings, and there should be at least the remnants of a civilization there, right? One of my personal challenges, having read through three-fourths of the Quran, is the Quran says that Jesus Christ was never even crucified. And yet there's external evidence from archaeology, from Roman historians, Jewish historians of that time who said Jesus was crucified and there's evidence for it. So one of the reasons I struggle with believing the Quran is it makes claims that the archaeological evidence doesn't support. Same thing with with the Book of Mormon. It makes claims about certain places as Jesus was in America. He crossed this river and he came to this city. We can go find these rivers or the location and we don't find the city or the ruins that are there. Now, in contrast, the Bible has been researched and used as a textbook for archaeological digs for thousands of years. And every year, thousands, if not tens of thousands every year of evidences are found but sure enough, the Bible says you have to go up to Jerusalem. That's a topo- topographical uh, claim. You have to go up to Jerusalem. It says that there was a city at this location, and we dig down and we find that city. We find that location. So the history and archaeology should back up the claims of a book if it's true. And I'm just going to give you a few pieces of my eyewitness testimony. This is from the February 2017 uh, Archaeology Review. That for years, people claimed that Solomon had a, a, a whole group of copper mines. And people said, no, Solomon, they weren't digging copper in that area. They didn't have copper in that time period. Yet I got to visit where an archaeological dig occurred, and they, sure enough, they found these gigantic copper mines, and they trace it bound to the very dates and times and archaeological evidence citing Solomon's reign. Now, this doesn't prove the Bible's true, but it shows you it's passing a test here. And if it was the only test, you'd say, okay, do more. Here's just a few things I've witnessed. The Bible says Jesus is speaking at a synagogue near Galilee. I've got to visit a synagogue. The remnants are there near Galilee. After he makes a claim, it says that the people don't like what he said, and they march him up a cliff to throw him off. And sure enough, here is the synagogue I got a chance to visit, and whoa, there's a cliff right next door. Huh. It says that Abram and Lot were going to divide up the land. And from this location, from this spot, they could see the remnants of cities to the north, south, east, and west. We went to this location, and they have found the remnants of all those cities all around. So we knew we were standing on the very spot that Abraham and Lot were because from that spot you can see all the ruins of the external claims made by the Bible. There's another one. King Herod's reference in the Bible as this monstrously powerful, monstrously rich man. There should be evidence for that, and there is. This is one of his palaces, is Masada, another one called the Herodian, another one on the sea. And this again continues to show the Bible, if it makes these claims, there should be evidence of these claims. Here's another one. Jesus goes to a Gethsemane. What's a Gethsemane? It's an olive press. So when we go to the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a section right near there where a cave has been turned into a church that was the largest wine press of that time, the Gethsemane, right at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, where they took the olives and pressed them or crushed them. 
Here's another one. This is from the Dead Sea. See, for years people thought that our earliest manuscript of the Old Testament, there was a huge gap between the copies we had and when it was written in the Old Testament. But there were a group called the Essenes who went through that process of counting every letter, counting every word. And when we found in these caves in Qumran the Dead Sea Scrolls, we jumped back. We had a copy of the scriptures thousands of years earlier than our earlier, our earlier manuscripts. And we could see, did anything creep in mistake-wise, changes-wise over those hundreds of years? The answer was 99.9% of them were identical. And the few changes didn't affect any major doctrine. And so the idea that the Bible's been a telephone game just does not support the evidence. There's another one. Uh, it says that Jesus went to heal a man who was stuck in a, in, or chained up in a, a grave near Decapolis, near the Sea of Galilee. So if you go to the Sea of Galilee and you go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, there should be a Decapolis, a, a Greek Roman city. And sure enough, it's a massive city there, right by the Sea of Galilee, just as the Bible claims. This pool in Jerusalem was claimed to not exist until several years ago. They dug down and found it. There's both a pool of Versailles and a pool of Siloam. They've dug and found both those things. Uh, Elijah claims that he climbed up to a portion on Mount Carmel. There's a mountain called Mount Carmel. It's in the same location. He could speak and thousands of people could hear him at once. Well, sure enough, there is an entire olive area down here, about 100 yards where we stood. Our leader came up to this section and he could speak from 100 yards above us and we could all hear him. These are actual historic events that when you go and do some tests, could this have happened in this location? You find out it did. The wise men are told that they moved from, from the east, they came from the east, and they came along this particular path. And sure enough, we got to visit one of Herod's factories, a spice factory, which had the very path that the wise men would have come down on the location that they said they went. Now, these are just a few of my eyewitness accounts. But there's literally, with no exaggeration, millions of pieces of archaeological evidence to support the Bible's claims. And so if you're interested in this, you can look into it. Now, another claim I don't have time to develop today, but I want to at least give you a resource. Another claim people make is, well, we can't believe in the Bible because of the Crusades, the horrible things the Bible has been done by people in Jesus' name. There's a great historian by the name of Rodney Stark. He's written this book called God's Battalions, where he tackles the Crusades specifically. I may do a whole message on it one day, but in case you're interested in a case that maybe it wasn't Christians you know, purposely targeting uh, innocent Muslims, he builds a case historically that's much like what we're seeing with ISIS today. There was a group of people spreading through, raping and killing, and Christians actually were standing up for the innocent, not for financial gain, not out of hatred, but to protect the innocent. And a great book called God's Battalions. All right, so... One more thing, there's an Oxford professor, I think it's Oxford, uh, yes, Sir William Ramsey. As he began to examine the evidence of Luke's claims in the book of Luke on Jesus, his eyewitness account, Sir Ramsey said this, Luke is a historian of the first rape. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along the very greatest of historians. So he says one of these books in the Bible, the book of Luke, is the greatest piece of history I've ever read as a historian when I began to look at the claims he made and the evidence to support it. So, if you'll buy the premise, even if you don't believe the Bible is God's word, that it could be historically accurate, who cares if nobody reads it? <laughs> right? How do you use this thing? One of the greatest things that happens to me weekly is I'll walk out of our atrium and I'll hear folks come up. I had three just in the last month. I've been at church for 35 years. And I've been coming for three weeks. And I don't know if I'm going to come back next week, but so far I'm enjoying it. That's high praise. And I always say, man, I just appreciate the trust. Folks saying, I've never studied the Bible my whole life. And for the first time, I'm in a Bible study. First time I'm in a women's Bible study. First time I'm in a men's study. It's the first time I opened the Bible and, and wasn't made to feel foolish because I didn't know what it meant. And it's gone from being opaque to beginning to understand the storyline. In fact, one of the greatest things when I'll gather together with new people and I'll say, what, what do you love most about Horizon? What I love is they don't say, Chad, we love you as a speaker. Chad, we don't love you as a band. Those are usually mentioned. But the first thing we hear more often than not is, I have learned more about the Bible coming here than 15 years of Christian education, 20 years of Catholic school, of 50 years of life. 
That is the focal point of our church. The reason we give, the reason we serve, the reason we have a multiple service design is we believe this book is not only historically accurate, but it tells you who you are, who God is, and how to find purpose and forgiveness in life. So how do you use it? I'll give you two ways. See, if the Bible can pass these tests, then two ways. Number one, you want to read the book. (laughs) If it really is God's word, if it really is reliable, just try reading it. Read the book that reads you. Just 15 minutes a day. Try it for a week. Try it for a month. Just 15 minutes. Start in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And just spend 15 minutes and see what God might do to you. Read the book that reads you. There was a French philosopher. His name was uh, Emile Calliette. He was in his 20s. He was serving in the war. And one day, he grew up in a very non-church, non-religious family. And one day, in the foxhole, he was standing next to his best friend. And as he was talking to his best friend, his best friend got shot right in the head, killed right in front of him. And he was devastated, as you can only imagine. He said, that moment, all of my philosophy, all of my theorizing about the universe felt so empty. I realized I needed some kind of a book that would understand me. I wanted to read a book that would understand who I was and speak to me. Just a few weeks later, he got shot and hospitalized. After he got out of the war, he returned to his graduate studies, and he said, I'm going to make a book that will read me. And fascinating, he would come across a passage of poetry, and he'd he'd like a particular piece, and he'd write it into his journal. He'd come to a piece of literature from Moby Dick, for example, and then he'd go, oh, I really like that, and he'd write that in his journal. After several years, he composed a book that he said, this is the book that understands me. This is the book that has spoken to me so many different ways throughout the years. He said, after he completed the last page, he he says he sat down under a tree one day, and he was ready to finally experience the book that understood him. He slipped open the pages, and as he began to read each entry, it reminded him of who he was two years ago when that happened, or last month when that happened. But he realized that the book he wrote to understand himself was aged. It It only spoke to the two years ago version of him, the six month ago version of him. And he was really dissatisfied that the book that he'd written to understand him, to read him, couldn't read him. Serendipitously, he didn't keep a Bible in his house because he thought it was ridiculous, religion. His wife happened to bring home a Bible for the first time, just as he's coming out of this experience. And he says, let me try reading it. He says he began to read this book, and unlike any other book he'd ever read before, he felt it could read him. And it could change. You could read the same passage this week or next week, and it would speak to you differently. It was like somebody was in there speaking to you. And here's what he said in his journal. I had never even seen a Bible by age 23, but on that day I was so eager to read the Bible that I literally grabbed the book and rushed into my study with it. I opened and it chanced upon the Beatitudes. Chanced, he put in quotes. I read and read and read, now aloud with an indescribable warmth surging within me. I could not find words to express my awe and my wonder. And suddenly the realization dawned upon me. This was the book that could understand me. I need it so much, yet unaware I had attempted to write my own in vain. I continued to read deeply into the night, mostly from the Gospels. And lo and behold, as I looked through them, the one of whom I spoke, the one who spoke and acted in them, became alive in me. Powerful. That God can speak to you. And and that's where you move from being religious to beginning to sense what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You begin to open the Bible, and and it happens over time. But there comes a place that it's almost like particular phrases are in bold print or italics as you read it. It's like there's someone in here, as weird as that sounds, talking to you, comforting you, strengthening you. And that is what Christians call the Holy Spirit speaking through this book. And you can read the same passage next year, five years from now, and it emphasizes things differently because it's the book that reads you. And if that just sounds like a weird experience, I would say just try it. We read lots of stuff we don't believe. Lots of stuff we don't believe. Make the Bible one of those. Fifteen minutes. Read the book that reads you. And number two, use the book that makes you useful. Don't you want to be useful? I want to be useful. I love being useful. The Bible says that it's created to be useful. 
Look what it says. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. I'll tell you what doctrine is in a second. For reproof, for correction and instruction. Here's four purposes for the Bible in righteousness. That the man, and here's the purpose. Here's what those things help you do. That the man of God may be complete. They'll help mature you as a husband, mature you as a leader, mature you as a friend. It will help make you mature or complete or better or useful as a human being. And you'll be thoroughly equipped... You'll get the stuff you need for life to be equipped for every good work. You want to know how to parent? It's in there. You want to know how to lead? It's in there. Use the book that makes you useful. And here's the four ways it works. Doctrine, it shows you right things to believe. To which you're like, well, I don't, I don't believe that there's right things to believe. Yeah, yeah, you do. Your daughter's thinking she's going to commit suicide. She's saying, you know, nobody likes me and my life's not worth living. What do you do? Doctrine. You speak truth. That's not a right belief, honey. You are loved. You are cared for. It, it, it does matter. What are you doing? You're speaking doctrine into her life. Beliefs. And you're doing reproof. You're correcting wrong beliefs. That's not true. That's not right. That's not healthy. The Bible gives you doctrine and reproof to take away the lies in your life. But it also helps you with behavior. Correction. It reverses a wrong behavior. Don't do that. That's not going to go well financially. That's not going to go well in your marriage. That's not going to go well in your parenting. It helps you reverse bad behaviors. And it then gives you the counter to show you a right behavior. So I'll close with this. This is one example of this. So my son graduated from high school last week. And we had three boys at the ceremony. And we could have just done a party and open house like we all do. But one of the things the Bible talks about is that you should take moments in significant moments in the life of your family and do what the Bible calls a blessing. We called it a parental toast. But what was informing us was the idea that the Bible says that you should take these moments and you should give a blessing, where you should look into the eyes of your kids and you should encourage them and affirm them. And don't miss the moment to encourage, put courage in them, to put blessing in them, to know that they are loved, not for what they do or what they've won, but for who they are. So we gathered together our, our three boys and we looked into their eyes and we told stories and we did the, the blessing. And this was my favorite moment from last week. Well, I got to speak in a three boys' life that has deeply impacted me. And I got to look into my son's eyes and tell him that he was loved and that I'm proud of him. And that our relationship is one of the most important things in my life. You know where I got that idea? Right here. It's a book that makes you useful. I could run a bad dad's Bible study any time because I'm a captain of the bad dad's club. But every once in a while I stumble across a good idea about how to be useful as a dad. And it comes out of a book that knows how to read me and a book that teaches me how to be useful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way in which you gave us instruction that we could know how to live and how to find purpose. Father, I ask we go out that this will be the beginning of a journey for many to investigate what is true, how true it is, and how to find purpose in life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today.